I really. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. My name is John Hodel, CloudPoint Geospatial. We're a geospatial consulting company here in Illinois, and we do uh, work in the asset management space. Uh, my background is in civil engineering, graduated from University of Illinois, and uh, we'll move, kind of migrated myself from engineering to GIS. I have a real passion for that and uh, really enjoy the technology. And um, what I want to talk about today is a project, actually we're, we're still wrapping this project up, but um, I know ADA compliance has been a, an issue um, with folks in the uh, asset management space, you know, municipal, state, government, anybody that has uh, roads and infrastructure, this has been a big issue. And uh, we recently were contacted about this project and we decided to get creative on, on how we accomplish this. And that's kind of what I wanted to share with you today was just how um, this technology can, can be used for that. So, so we'll give you kind of an overview of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, one will be the uh, intro to the ADA requirements and just kind of touch briefly on those and what, uh, what is necessary there with those requirements. Then we'll talk about the standards um, on what we're trying to measure or meet as we look at uh, using GIS for, for this. And we have the specific project I'll talk about is a project took place in Texas. Give you a little bit of that uh, project history and then kind of an overview as well as uh, the process that we went through. And then we'll finish up with any questions you might have. So American with Disabilities Act was uh, began in 1990 um, by uh, passed into law by President George W. H. Uh, George H. W. Bush, and the uh, this was something that they had been uh, moving towards for quite a while with civil rights, and um, you know I think some of it uh, finally was able to capture some attention of the decision makers. If you've ever heard of um, uh, what's known as maybe have been known as the Capitol Crawl. Uh, I think that was something else that helped get attention where folks with disabilities actually uh, crawled up the steps of the Capitol. And I think that really uh, spoke to some of the legislatures. So um, and then since then, there's been some uh, amendments. 2008, there was the Amendment Act um, that uh, kind of clarified some of the definitions and also um, really kind of uh, cleared some things up there. Then in, in 2010 is when these standards were released um, that we'll kind of talk about and touch in, in more detail. But these standards are available. <clears throat> There's a website, ada.gov, that has all this information on there, and these standards are available there. So as we uh, get into the standards and what's required, so there's this concept called the path of travel that we need to be aware of, uh, an accessible path of travel. It can consist of uh, sidewalks, curb ramps, uh, any pathway for pedestrians is important to consider. Um, it needs to be have certain clearance requirements, uh, width, um, all types of different uh, uh, asset qualities that we're looking for. And honestly, when you're talking about measuring and dealing with space, GIS is, is a wonderful tool to be able to use for that. Uh, we, with uh, parking areas are also an area, uh, an issue area of concern where these need to be uh, monitored and measured and make sure these are up to uh, code. Um, so construction prior to March of 2012 um, is one where the public entity is not required to ref retrofit some of these elements. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today and these requirements depends on when the facilities were built. So it's important to keep in mind. So there's new constructions, and there's uh, alterations, and those are all addressed uh, within the standards as well. Specifically, what we're gonna focus on as I talk more about this project and what these requirements consisted of and what we were actually looking for. So chapter four of the uh, accessible design uh, standards, walking surfaces, uh, slopes, and it's important when we talk about slopes for pedestrian ways, we're looking at running and crossing slope, or cross slope. So running slope is your longitudinal slope as you're going in the pathway of the sidewalk. Of course, cross slope is that slope that um, goes across. 
And we want to look at changes in level. So these might commonly be considered like if you've heard a trip hazard or a barrier, those would be uh, level changes in level of your sidewalk and pedestrian ways would definitely uh, qualify. And then clearances, there needs to be room for ADA accessibility with wheelchairs. They need certain requirements to have clear space to be able to maneuver and turn around. So if you've got a, a sidewalk, um, you know, it can only be so long. If, if it's narrow, uh, it needs to be able to have an area for, for turning around. Um, so building entrances is another thing we're going to look at that uh, with this particular project that we, we were able to uh, assess as well as curb ramps. And, and then in chapter five is more general site requirements. And that's where we get into the parking spaces and the handrails specifically in that section. So a little bit of history, the community college in Texas reached out to us uh, earlier this year. They were hit with a uh, settlement for non-compliance with ADA across their campus. And what happened was they received some complaints and the Department of Justice got looking into this and they said, hey, you've got a lot of issues here and these issues need to be addressed. Uh, so as a result, they contracted with a licensed architect there in Texas and he reached out to us and uh, asked if we could help them essentially provide a site assessment for ADA compliance of the entire campus. And they are under a time, uh, time constraint because of this settlement. So uh, parts of the settlement included uh, for after th within three months, they're required to have a plan for identifying the streets, roads, and pedestrian ways um, that have been constructed or altered since January of 92 and a timetable for providing compliance. So that three months just, hey, you have to have a plan on how you're going to address these and what that's going to look like. Uh, within six months of the date of this settlement, they needed to have a survey of all the college's newly constructed facilities. And um, so the U.S. Uh, Department of Justice came in and they provided a preliminary survey to verify that, hey, some of these things are not up to snuff. And as a result of that preliminary survey, they said, okay, now you've got to do more and you really need to come in and assess these areas. So... Um, within one year of the date, they are to submit a detailed report that lists all of the access issues identified uh, during the uh, architect's review. So this actually includes interior spaces as well as exterior across the campus. For our project, we're just looking at the exterior only. Then 24 months um, is the deadline they need to have uh, curb ramps and other sloped areas complying with the applicable standards. So in other words, there's going to be a lot of retrofit work that needs to be done. Um, it's going to be very expensive, but our objective then is to provide them a complete assessment and then as, for the, as far as the exterior spaces, as well as then a, kind of a rough idea that gives them the ability to measure or provide cost estimates on what that's going to take. Um, so they, they, I looked through their uh, survey that the Department of Justice uh, completed. There's 144 code violations just in that, and that wasn't even the whole campus. So they had quite a few that they needed um, assistance with uh, complying. Everything from assisted listening systems, accessible seating to the ball field, uh, including turning spaces and locker rooms. So all of those were just different things that were mentioned in that survey. So. Um, a project overview for us, review all parking spaces, parking lot access locations, sidewalks, building entrances, curb ramps, and approach ramps to make sure they meet the requirements, including width, height, cross slope, and running slope. Uh, something that traditionally has always been done by hand with a pen and uh, clipboard. Um, they wanted all locations flagged. They needed uh, reference photos included and points shown on a map. They also needed the uh, data to be analyzed and reported for non-compliance and make recommendations on improvements to upgrade the facilities. So when we look at this, we're looking at 200 acres of campus with buildings, pavement, sidewalks, everything, a large area, th over 30,000 feet of sidewalk, 150 curb ramps, 200 building entrances, and 157 parking spaces, which if you 
think about it, collecting that information by hand with a clipboard, pen and paper, and a paper map is just not very efficient. And when you're done, you have a bunch of paper and not a good way to compile that and deliver it in a format that's usable. So here's a snapshot of the campus and what it kind of looked like. So um, you can see all of the pathways highlighted uh, here that specifies pedestrian walkways. It gets a little tricky because some of these areas are a full courtyard that's paved uh, with large sidewalk panels. So you get into the issue of, okay, does that qualify as a pedestrian way or not? And for this, for this particular project, you know, they determined that, hey, all of this in this courtyard needs to be a, a ADA compliant. So it was a little bit spread out on this particular uh, project, but you'll see that we were able to use the technology uh, to help with that. So just a snapshot here of what actually takes place if you're you know, doing this by hand. Um, in this case, this is an example where um, our field tree is using a iPad and collecting with a digital level. That digital level gives you a readout that's uh, to the nearest tenth of a, of a percent there. Um, and then he'll record that information with a point on the map uh, and take a photo as well. Um, so we started with this plan in mind. We said, hey, we're ready. Let's go out and start doing some data collection. As we got ready, for that data collection, we first looked at, okay, what imagery is available? We gathered as much CAD information. They had some decent CAD information from the campus as far as maps and buildings. Uh, but we knew sidewalks was you know, a big part of what we're gonna be looking for. So we digitized the sidewalks that we could see. Uh, we really wanted to fly our drone to collect imagery over the entire campus. However, there's an airport right next door. So they shot us down on that. Um, and, and we weren't allowed to fly the drone there. So we were kind of using some Esri's native imagery. It wasn't that great. We did finally, uh, were able to contact a vendor who had some better uh, aerial imagery that we were able to get from them. So we took that. Um, we published these layers to ArcGIS Online. This was gonna be our um, you know, form of collection to be able to gather this data. We set up a map, we published it to AGO, and then we used field maps. Um, which is kind of the newer, uh, most of you are probably familiar with that, it's taken the place of collector. And then also we needed our equipment, what are we gonna measure this stuff with? So the digital level was a key component uh, in our arsenal. And then um, vertical measuring devices, so what are you gonna measure the trip hazards with? We picked up, actually stopped at Lowe's, and uh, we got a little, um, it's like a, a little ruler with an L shape that you can slide up and down to measure your vertical gap with, so that was really helpful. And of course, tape measures and iPads. And with that, we set off to uh, start our collection project. So here, just looking briefly, we have um, our ArcGIS online map showing um, a sample of what it looks like and what we were collecting. So all of the starred locations that you see here were places where we were taking slope measurements. And in the field, they were wanting a slope measurement recorded every 10 feet. So you can imagine how long that's taking when you look at recording a slope measurement. Now keep in mind, this is both cross and running slope every 10 feet, and you're recording that, it's just taken a lot of time. Um, the good thing is GIS definitely helps with this. You know, uh, field maps is very efficient. And once we get that data collected, we can quickly analyze our points and say, hey, what's greater than, you know, the requirements were 2% on the cross slope and typically 5% on the running slope. We could easily just run a query and say, show me all my points that are non-compliant. Easy enough from the analyst, uh, analysis side. However, um, we found some issues on the data collection side. I wanna get into that a little bit more, but um, we still are using uh, this format. We're not, with the new technology, new approach, we're not abandoning using field maps and, and the iPads, but we're supplementing um, with other things to make this more of a, a complete picture. So here's an example where we, um, with the trip hazards, this was a device I was explaining, be able to measure that uh, vertical distance, anything greater than a quarter inch, we needed a flag and that would be uh, qualifying as a, as a barrier. So again, we just created a layer for trip hazards and flagged those um, as we went along. However, 
we discovered after we got started, we flew our field crew down there. They started and after um, three to four days of collection in the field, they came back and had some great data and they worked their hind ends off and came back and we were 10 to 15% complete. And we said, this is not gonna work when we figured on 10 to 12 days of data collection. Um, we said, this is just a slow process, it's gonna take forever. And I think by the end, uh, they would have been pretty worn out and pretty disheartened uh, at the progress. So um, one thing is the client didn't necessarily specify, I said earlier they did, this 10 foot spacing, but we, we quickly identified, you know, hey, this, this is not only gonna give you uh, a fairly decent coverage, but there's some problems with just saying, I'm gonna go every 10 feet and measure across slope. Um, one of the issues we found with that was uh, it got a little bit subjective. Where do you take that measurement of cross slope? If you move that level back just a foot or two, you might get a different reading. You might get a reading that is in compliance. So where do you where do you draw that line? Where do you determine, yes, this stretch of sidewalk is good or no, it's not good? Um, so that was one of the challenges that kind of started driving us to ask some of these questions. Um, so we came to the client and basically said, Hey, we're going to try a different approach to this. We're going to use some uh, technology involving LIDAR scanning. And uh, they were okay with that. They were a little bit nervous because once he saw how much data we were gathering, he was worried that we we're going to uncover more non-compliance, um, which is, is a possibility. But the point is, it's in the end, we're doing a better job of assessing the real situation. So we said, there's got to be a better way. That led us to making that statement. Now, it's good to think that way in most scenarios, for example, but in some areas and sometimes in life, it's not good to say there's got to be a better way. For me, that example is when I'm helping uh, at home around the house and I'm helping my wife in the kitchen and I jump in to offer my two cents and say there's got to be a better way. And that's not always a good idea. So I wouldn't recommend that. But when it comes to projects and solving problems, come, uh, sometimes we're forced into corners where we have to say, look, let's try something new. There's gotta be a better way here. And we are we were really thankful we did ask that question with this one. So rather than measure a bunch of good sidewalk, we said, let's try to identify and eliminate the good from our collection process. That was really what we wanted to do because we were spending a lot of time measuring slopes that were good in some areas, we said, stop wasting our time doing that. There's a better way that we can accomplish this in a, in a quicker fashion. <clears throat> so I remembered I, I had written a blog um, a couple years back and I was playing around with some aerial LIDAR data on one of our municipal clients and I decided, hey, I wonder what this looks like if we run uh, aerial LIDAR and we create a raster and we run the slope tool and see what this looks like with this aerial LIDAR. It was pretty interesting. What I found was um, it worked really well, but unfortunately the density of the LIDAR data from the aerial LIDAR was not dense enough to give me the results I was really wanting to see, which was not a surprise to me, but you're talking, I think with this one, I think they're about uh, four points per square meter, between one and four points per square meter. Um, so as a result, we were only able to get so accurate on this. What I found was really interesting it did accurately identify anywhere where there was a retaining wall next to the sidewalks. It really picked those out really well. You can see in the bright red there. Um, so retaining walls, anywhere there was a drop off next to the sidewalks, it really picked that up crystal clear. So I just was browsing through there in the results and was able to pick up any areas, one where there's retaining walls, but if there was an area where there was a drop off and there wasn't maybe a handrail that needed to be there, um, you know, we again, this wasn't a complete project, but I was just kind of playing around with it and we discovered, hey, there's some real value here. And so I, I thought of this and I remembered, wait a minute, what's keeping us from using LIDAR only getting some denser coverage and then see what we can do with ADA compliance. So in comes the, uh, the new process. So uh, we decided to use a uh, mobile scanner um, it's what I, you know, you might have heard of being a, like a backpack uh, scanning unit. In this case, we used what's called the GeoSlam Zeb Horizon. Um, and 
we placed about 70 reference points first and GPS locations because we wanted to be able to geo-reference our scan data. And this uh, particular unit was collecting 300,000 points a second. Um, the range is about 100 meters, about 300 feet on what it was picking up. So it really did a good job even outdoors on collecting uh, scan data. Um, going through airport security was kind of interest, uh, interesting when they would open it up and take a look at it, and you'd have to explain kind of what this was. But uh, We flew down there with the scanner. We completed 21 scans of the total that covered the whole campus. Uh, 14 of those were routes that we walked. We would actually circle buildings. Uh, we would come up, we would, this is important as you think about this process. You want to plan your route as you collect plan your route ahead of time and we would go around buildings and sometimes make a figure eight around those buildings depending on how much area we wanted to cover on that particular scan and then we would also using field maps we would stream our position as we walked so we could kind of see that on a map on where we were covering and where we'd already been that worked out really well um, just streaming a line creating a line as we walked and did our scan collection so total um and we also learned that we wanted a minimum of four reference points per scan. Uh, that was really important because if we had two or three, it just was not, um, you could get a geo-reference, but if one of those was off, you were running into trouble. So a minimum of four points per scan is what we found. Total, when we were finished, we had over 80 gig worth of um, LAS data when we were finished. But we were able to accomplish that in two days. So what we were looking at previously, which was probably 20 to 25 days of data collection, we were able to do in two days. And obviously we had a lot more data to work with now. Here's what the map looked like after we had the reference points out. And this is overlaid with our pathways that we took as we walked around the buildings. Um, you can see some of those, we basically covered every building around the outside because we wanted to get all the way up to the entrance. We wanted to make sure we were measuring slope of all the sidewalk and all the entrance locations as well. That was really important to us. And then, um, I don't know if I mentioned in the last slide, but we, uh, the 14 that we uh, walked, we went around the buildings, the last seven we did with a golf cart. The facilities folks were nice enough to say, hey, we can't let you take all our golf cart and run off with it, but we can have Val, our office manager, drive you around. So Val took us around the campus and she absolutely loved it. I think she wants to be a a GIS professional now, but she drove us around. We held the LIDAR scanner out in front of the cart and were able to collect um, a lot of really good data. So that kind of summarizes the pathways that we took and what we were using for reference points. So the processing that took place afterwards, processing the scan data, um, we, first of all, we would after, um, we wouldn't collect more than maybe three or four scans before we would want to come back and dump those. Um, so the, the way it works is you finish, you take the handheld, you walk around and you set it down and you say stop. And then you plug in a flash drive and it just in a matter of a few seconds, it dumps all your data on the flash drive and then it clears itself out and you're ready to go collect another scan. So we would do about three or four scans. We would take that flash drive and plug it into the laptop and drop those files onto what's called GeoSlam Hub. That's the processing software that um, initially, we'll take your raw scan data and, and uh, turn it into um, an LAS there. Uh, then we used, uh, for geo-referencing, we used GeoSlam's Draw, or it's also, you might have heard of PointCab, which is another program um, that we used for that geo-referencing part. So we did that. Then we, um, if we needed to, you wouldn't have to. This is kind of optional, but I found that it was helpful. If you, with all this data, you can subsample it. Uh, in a, in a uh, software called Cloud Compare. If you're familiar with that, it's an open source uh, free download and you can subsample or in other words, decrease the spacing of your points to shrink your file sizes down. So we are finding that a spacing of about 0.03 meters, uh, about three centimeters was working really well for our subsample data. Again, you wouldn't have to, but when you plug it into ArcGIS Pro, it definitely processes much quicker and you can work with it easier. Uh, then, then we brought in ArcGIS Pro. We had LAS files. They were geo-referenced. Um, they were, you know, optimized, and we brought those into ArcGIS Pro, and that's where we started really the, the uh, analysis on the slope. 
the LIDAR, uh, what the, the huge time savings is really in the slope measurements. That's what was taking us all the time. So that's really where we found value here. Oh, and then um, we ground truthed. So the fact that we had our, our field crew out there doing manual collection for the first couple of days, that was huge because then we had a bunch of data we could ground truth with this LIDAR to say, hey, is this working or not? So that was fantastic. We were really glad to have that data. This is just a screenshot of what the kind of the raw or the uh, LAS files look like. Obviously a ton of points. You can kind of see some of the building outlines here. You can see the detail that I gathered in the light poles. Um, but this was obviously the buildings and the trees and light poles is not really what we were after. This is an ADA compliance assessment. So we were interested in ground surface only. So as a result of that, we decided to process it, like I said, taking the ground surface uh, and classifying that only. The next step, we converted it to um, a raster. So you take your LAS and convert it to a raster. And um, then we run a slope analysis on it in ArcGIS Pro. So this is what you get um, as a result. Now, this is all trimmed. So you, you can imagine this raster covered the whole campus. We were just interested in the sidewalks and pavement areas where uh, ADA compliance was necessary. So um, we trimmed it using, we had digitized all the sidewalks and then we clipped it um, so we could just look at those areas. So the two areas I'm looking at here in the red circles, these are actually sidewalks that have steps in them. And they're just gradual steps, which you can see here, each of them has three steps in it. It lights up in bright red because that slope is steeper than your 2%. Uh, areas in dark green, that is 2% or flatter. Areas that are in a little lighter green, those are between two and 5% in our, uh, in our analysis. So we just ran that in ArcGIS Pro and then we categorized or symbolized uh, based on the slope. Um, I might not have mentioned it, but the cell size on these, uh, I believe is uh, 0.25 feet. I think that's uh, three inches. So um, that was our cell size as we ran this analysis. But the whole objective of this um, was to create or to find these accessible routes from the parking spaces to the building entrance. That's really our goal here. And we wanna be able to assess those and make sure those are, are in compliance. If they're not in compliance, we wanna flag them and specify that. Here's another area we gathered. This is a parking, access, uh, par accessible parking. So you can see here what's interesting. Um, it might be a little bit hard to see, but when I circled the parking area, the parking area itself is pretty compliant. You see the dark green, nice and flat, 2% or less. However, as you look at the uh, sidewalk and then the ramps, you can see the ramps are lit up in yellow and even a small area of red. And then you can see in the photo how that makes sense. So I'm trying here to compare the, the raster with the photo so you can kind of get a feel for actually how, how accurate that is and really the kind of results we can get from that. One more area, I thought this was really interesting. So here we have a snapshot, an area of sidewalk uh, just outside of one of the buildings where we had some trip hazards. There is a trip hazard or vertical barrier right in front of the level as we're looking at it. And then there's also one about, about four, three panels back, there's another trip hazard. If you look at the LIDAR slope results, you can actually see red dots in the middle of the sidewalk where the first trip hazard is, and you also see some in the second one. So that was kind of fascinating. Now, I will say, this did not work for pulling out all trip hazards. That's, that's really not what we were using. We did the trip hazards manually, um, you know, using the slope analysis, but I thought it was interesting that it did catch a few of them uh, in the process. So again, if you're looking at this on a, on a high detailed level, um, if you wanted to, you could see these trip hazards in the in the LIDAR data itself. If you ran a profile to the LAS points, you would be able to pick them up there, but we didn't um, go through that process. We did them manually in the field. So lessons learned throughout the project, um, wanted to kind of mention some things that we learned. So the scanning process likes metric. Everything, you know, natively it came out metric. A lot of it, we just, we left in metric until we got into uh, RPS Pro. Um, but some of that 
at times it's a little bit uh, funny if you try to use English units too early in the process. So we did uh, try to maintain the native metric uh, when we could. I mentioned already the minimum four reference points per scan is what you're going to want to have. Um, mobile collection. So when we took the golf cart and we had the LiDAR scanner on that, we want to do that in a forward direction. You will see examples of things mounted on the back of a vehicle or in this, you know, with this particular scanner, I've seen photos online, a bunch of them where they have it on the back of a vehicle. And what we found was that data was not as dense. It just, it just didn't work as well. So going in a forward direction was really important, we found. A maximum of 10 miles per hour is what we found worked well for us. That's based on the scanner's ability to collect the number of points at that speed and to get the proper density. If we went any faster than 10 miles an hour, we didn't have the density that we were looking for. Another thing we learned, um, ArcGIS Pro did handle larger data sets than what we anticipated with the LiDAR. So we were able to really uh, leverage ArcGIS Pro and its LAS tools and features, uh, and it worked, worked much better than we anticipated. And then uh, we also, big point we took away was processing the sidewalks for running slope and cross slope proved difficult. Um, it was challenging because when you're running that slope, it's kind of just taking the steepest slope if you're looking at a cell size and whatever direction that slope in, it's just giving you a number on based on what that slope is. Well, you need to know which direction that's sloping. So is it going longitudinal or is it going across the sidewalk? So what we actually did was created center lines of all the sidewalks and then we set, ran a, there's a tool, I can't remember the name of it now, but it'll segment, essentially give you a lateral line whatever distance you want to specify. Uh, in this case, we did 10 feet. And then we were able to say, I want to analyze all these lateral lines. I want to know the slope uh, between the endpoints of those. And it actually worked pretty well uh, to be able to look at that analysis. So um, like I said, we're not finished yet. That's still something we're, we're looking at. We're finding that it's working um, on that type of analysis for that. So. Uh, that's kind of that's it in summary of of the project and kind of the process we went through and uh, some things that we learned about it. Um, so hopefully you find that uh, beneficial as we consider how we can use the technology and leverage it to be able to um, measure things uh, such as the ADA compliance. So with that, I'd uh, go ahead and open it up to questions if there are any. Yes. So we it wasn't the view shed tool. We actually used um, just the slope tool. Um, I believe it's uh, using 3D analyst extension. Um, and then that slope will, again, give you either a percent or you can do a degree and you can use that to shade your cells in with. Yeah, I did come across another tool in ArcGIS Pro. Um, that you're able to view the direction of the slope based on color, but I felt like that was going to be more of a manual process because these sidewalks were kind of all over the place. They weren't just kind of all running in one direction. I think that might have been useful if they were all generally running one direction. I had one more here. So when you mounted that device, uh... Was it a <laughs> Sorry, I didn't specify that. We actually held it with our hand. So this is the front of the golf cart, pulled down the windshield, and we sat there with it. And I'll tell you the reason that was beneficial, because if you want to collect reference points, you have to set the scanner down on the reference point for five seconds. So if you've got that mounted, you're constantly up and down with that. So thanks for asking that question. It's a great point to bring up. No, the GeoSlam equipment, that's one, uh, there's there's an older GeoSlam called the Zeb Revo, and that one you can see on an iPad, you can see the collection being done as you go. It's building your point cloud. The Horizon, I think because of the amount of points you're collecting, it does not have that capability. So you're kind of scanning in the dark, so to speak. When you get done, you process your data, but really every scan we did, we got good data from, so it shouldn't be a major concern.
I don't know. That might have been curb we were looking at. Yeah. Sorry, and I should be repeating these questions for our audience online. So how far apart should, okay, so how far apart should the reference points be per scan? Um, it really didn't, we didn't find that it made a big difference. What did make a difference is if you were starting here and you were going a half mile at the end of your scan, we always completed a loop and we finished where we started at. Um, so it's more important that you have even spacing on your reference points. Um, I'd say that's more important and make sure you have a minimum of four. Ask what was the cost of that GeoSlam device? So, what was the cost of the GeoSlam device? I think um, we actually rented this one for this project, but we may be buying one in the future. But they're going to cost anywhere, won't be on this, fifty to sixty thousand dollars, maybe. Um, and there's a lot of bells and whistles you can get on them. You can get a GPS antenna to uh, give you RTK and and be able to do the trajectory and all that. So, yeah, there's a lot of things add-ons you can do with it. Yes, sir. Yeah, good question. So the question was, can you um, essentially automate some of the ADA code compliance and be able to have that light up from the results of the scan automated? We did not try that just because it was brand new. So we just uh, basically took what was in the code and we just uh, manually put in those different um, segments of the uh, symbology. Yep, good question though. If you figure that out, let me know. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you.